Well, you can have a seat. Good morning. My name is Susie. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so excited to introduce you to our guest today. Um, Christy McClelland is known pretty well around these parts as a extraordinary Bible teacher. She actually calls herself a biblical culturist, culturalist because she shares a, a value that we have here at Journey, and that is um, the study and, and reading of scripture in its context and um, in the ways of the Jewishness of Jesus and the way that it was written, that it has things to speak to us that transcend time and space and cultures and all kinds of really good things. Um, several years ago when I moved here, people kept telling me, you got to meet Christy, you got to meet Christy. And I'm like, who is this Christy? And now we're friends and it's awesome. And she's changed the lives of a lot of people because she's, she's refreshed the way that we, we look at scripture. Um, she leads people on trips to Israel, so if you've ever wanted to go to Israel, you should jump on her website, newlensbiblicalstudies.com, and um, see when you might be able to join her on a trip. That is her absolute passion, and she teaches Bible study all around, and she has some Bible studies that are now published through Lifeway, and her reach is, is going from Middle Tennessee, where it was for a number of years, beyond even our country. So. Um, I'm so excited for you to get to know her a little bit. And she, the, she understands our culture of questions because it's actually how she normally teaches. So feel free to text in your questions and ask your questions, and she'll lead us through that herself. So would you welcome Christy McClelland? Thank you, friend. Thank you. Oh, well, good morning, Journey. Good morning. It's good to see you all. I feel like I'm your cousin in the faith fellow Franklinite, we all have the privilege of sort of sharing this city together, and when Pastor Susie asked me if I could come be with and among you all today, I got so excited, because it's not my first time being here with you all, but every time I've ever been here, I can actually say I felt better after I left. How many of you sometimes when you're leaving church, you just feel better, you're so glad you came? And so this morning, we are going to experience the scriptures together. Uh, for the last 15 years, I have been taking teams to Israel, and one of the gifts of the Jews for me is they don't talk about reading the Bible, they talk about eating the Bible, feasting on the Bible. And the Bible, for 2,000 years, the church has understood that we are meant to eat it, process it, question it, yeshiva it together. The Bible is communal activity in this communal invitation. It's interesting, the Apostle Paul, throughout the Bible, when he talks about inheritance, he rarely is referencing money or financial things. When the Apostle Paul talks about inheritance, he's often talking about the inheritance of the saints, that we literally are richer and wealthier for knowing each other. So I want you just to look to your neighbor right now and say, I am so glad you get to sit next to me this morning. <laughs> to me this morning. I am a gift the living God is trying to give you. So uh, as we settle in today, we are going to yeshiva. So if you are shy, you have about one minute to pray about it because we are going to experience and feast on the Bible together. I personally have spent the summer in Hebrews chapter 11. Sometimes we call it the great hall of faith, and that's where we're going to be anchored today. But I want to begin with a question. As we yeshiva, I want you to think about the things in the Bible that are feminine in the way that it's talked about. For example, I'll give you the first one. The church is known as the bride of Christ. Okay, there's your first one. Tell me something else, not a person. We're not talking Esther, Deborah. Tell me something in the Bible that's feminine. Holy Spirit, absolutely. The Hebrew word ruach, everybody say that with me. Ruach, the Hebrew word for spirit, is feminine. And in the Bible, anytime you see the spirit hovering, she is getting ready to come down and do something. Can somebody say amen? We want the spirit to come down and do some things. What else in the Bible is feminine? 
Ooh, Lady Wisdom, who said that? You're my friend, right there. Lady Wisdom, wisdom in the Bible is personified as a woman. Lady Wisdom, Proverbs 9, 1 through 6. I'm thinking of one more. Can anybody think of one other thing in the Bible that's feminine, that's like massive and awesome? It's Torah. Torah is a feminine noun. The law is a girl. Israel gave her to the people that she might know how to live in the shalom of the living God. Chrissy, why are we talking about feminine things in the Bible? Feel free to text your questions. Pastor Susie told me if she grabs the mic, I need to shut up because she has a question. So feel free to text your questions. The reason I start with this, y'all, is a woman is going to show us a perspective of faith today a woman out of Hebrews 11, but it's a different kind of faith than what we often think about. When you read Hebrews 11, it tells you all about what these people did. And Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain, and Noah built an ark, and Abraham obeyed and went. But this morning, we're going to tune our ears into the grace of God that faith also works in another direction. And a woman is going to show us the way. She's not named in Hebrews 11, but the Bible is going to name her and it's going to give us her story. And a woman is going to show us the way this morning. Now, we're getting ready to read our principal passages for today. And one of the things I learned from the Jewish people is they always stand for God's word and then they sit back down for man or woman's words. So I want to invite you into that rhythm with me, Journey, because we're cousins. And Pastor Susie said I can do this today. So I want to invite you to stand with me. The passages are going to be on the screens around the room. And I want to invite you to actually read them out loud with me. Let's put this in the earth this morning morning. Let's confess it. Let's proclaim it together. We're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 39 and then we're going to make our way into Hebrews 11 and our story for today. If you are with me, say okay. All right, here we go. Hebrews 10 39 says this, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Keep reading with me. And by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. While you're standing, I want us to practice something that the church has been doing for 2,000 years and the Jewish people have been doing it for even longer. I want to invite you just to take your right hand and look at it. The word hand is found in the Bible some 1,600 times. There's something about our hands. And the Bible talks very specifically about the right hand. The right hand is the hand of favor. It's the hand of honor. It's the hand of blessing. In Israel, they never reach for you with their left hand. That's considered shameful. They always reach for you with their right hand. And I want us to put our right hands upon one another this morning and pray that the living God might posture us to receive what it is that the Spirit wants to say to all of us through the Word today. So if you feel comfortable doing this, I want to invite you to put your right hand on the shoulder of the person sitting to your right. If you see somebody and you need to kind of move toward them, if you don't know their name, ask them for it. And I want to give you the inheritance of the saints this morning. So now that you know your person's name, that brother, that sister, that guest, that visitor sitting next to you, we're just going to bow our heads, and you can do it quietly or out loud, whatever your flow is, but I want you to pray for that person. I want you to ask the living God to clear the deck for them, to let them be fully present, totally here, all in that we might inherit the riches of who God is this morning. 
in the Bible and that I'm going to pray for us as a whole and then we're going to make our way into our story. Father God, thank you for this Sunday morning. Thank you for this gathering in the city known as Journey Church, a table set for the inheritance of the saints. And Father, even as we have our right hands upon each other right now, favoring, honoring, blessing, interceding, contending for each other in prayer, Father, I just pray for every human life in this room right now, everyone joining us online, that, Father, you would clear the deck for us. That you would calm our souls right now, Lord. That you would ready us, that you would open us, that we might be ready to take in the feast of the word of God that you have prepared for us. Lord, would you move among your people? Would you do things in us, for us, and through us that we cannot do for ourselves? Father, thank you for this body. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the spirit. And thank you that today a woman is going to show us the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for blessing each other. So back to our story from Hebrews 11. Moses' parents for three months hide him because they are not afraid of the king's edict. Hebrews 11 doesn't name Moses' parents. But scripture is going to give us their names. In Exodus and Numbers, Moses' father, his name was Amram. Everybody say that with me. Amram. Moses' mother's name was Yaakoved. Everybody say that with me. Yaakoved. So we know their names. Interestingly enough, though, Hebrews 11 says that Moses' parents hid him, but we're getting ready to go look at this story, and it doesn't say they. It keeps saying she. And she, and she, and her, and her. This story of faith that we're getting ready to learn from today, this is Yaakoved's story. We're getting ready to drop down into the book of Exodus and see what we can learn. Now, a little bit about Yaakoved. According to the Bible, she had three children. Raise your hand if you have multiple children. I'm fascinated by that. I'm an only child. So those of you with multiple kids, Jacob has three children. One, his name was Aaron. He would go on to become the high priest of Israel. Everybody go, wow. (laughs) Then there's Miriam. She is known as a prophet, or we might say a prophetess, because she's a woman. Everybody go, that's amazing. And then you have Moses. His name is Moshe, and Moses is often referred to as the deliverer. Because after 430 years in Egypt, the living God's going to raise him up to deliver his people out of the hands of the Egyptians and into freedom in the wilderness. Now, my point is simply this. Can we all agree that Yaakov is batting three for three with her kids? (laughs) She's doing pretty good. A high priest, a prophet, and the deliverer. (laughs) You know, I have a really good friend. She's got three kids. A few weeks ago, I was catching up with her. I was like, hey, friend, how's your family? How are your kids doing? And she goes, you know, I like two out of the three right now. (laughs) I was like, well, at least we're in positive territory. I have another friend when her kids are kind of out there, kind of doing their own thing, maybe not making the wisest decisions. She'll just say, oh, girl, he's out there just working on his testimony. (laughs) I love that. Right? But Yaakovad, man, Yaakovad is batting three for three with these kids. And so now I want us to come back quickly to Hebrews 11. What is this king's edict that is upon Amram and Yaakovad that they're going to hide Moses for three months? They're not afraid of the king's edict. Now let's go to Exodus chapter 1, verse 22. The scriptures will be on the, the screens for you. It says this. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Now, I don't have time to teach this. We'll have to do this some other time. But can I just say that the Pharaoh underestimated the girls? Because in the end, it will be six women who are his downfall and his undoing. 
two Hebrew midwives. Their names were Shifra and Pua. You have Yaakoved, Moses' mother, Miriam, Moses' sister. You have the Pharaoh's own daughter and her Egyptian maidservant. The Pharaoh was afraid of the boys. He has an edict of infanticide. Every male Hebrew boy that is born, I want you to drown him in the Nile. And yet in the end, it'll be the women who were his undoing. Now, I am a Bible nerd. I don't know if Pastor Susie told you that, but I had the opportunity to study in Egypt and in Israel, and I want to show you a picture of a hieroglyph in a tomb in Egypt, and I want you to look at that picture as you hear my voice now as we process it. This gives us a good idea of this edict, this spirit of pharaonic power of empire. The pharaohs are always larger on a hieroglyph. This is Ramses III. This is a place called the Medinet Habu Temple in Egypt. Ramses III, some scholars believe, was the last great pharaoh of Egypt before the Egyptian empire started to decline. And you'll notice he is holding a sickle in one hand. It is raised. He has captured two Libyans. He is holding them by the tops of their heads, and he's getting ready to run them through. I want you to look how menacing that picture is, and it gives you the spirit of this edict that Amram and Yaakov are under when we come to our story in Exodus. Now, if you're still with me, say, okay. A woman's going to show us the way today. What type of faith did Yaakov exhibit, and what is it that we can learn from it today? Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says this. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi, everybody say Amram, Married a Levite woman, everybody say Yaakov, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Now, this is an interesting statement to me because most parents do think that their babies are beautiful, right? So this idea that Moses is a fine child, what does this even mean? mean, and I want us to drop down into the Hebrew language because language and culture matters. It enhances our understanding of the story of the text. That word fine there, in Hebrew, it's the word tov. Everybody say that with me, tov. Tov is the Hebrew word for good, but it's not just good. It's like deep good. This is like Garden of Eden good. It's the same word that is used in Genesis 1 and 2 at creation when the living God is creating all things. And he keeps saying, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. It was tov. It was tov. It was very Tove, there is something about Moshe, something about Moses that Yaakov is noticing. And if you're the Chronicles of Narnia people in here, there's something about Moses that's the signs of spring. There is a hopefulness. Something about him is raising this Edenic good, this idea of good things. The deliverer has been birthed into the world, and now the story is underway. We carry on in Exodus 2. It says this, but when she could hide him no longer. Can you feel that? Can you feel that? But when she could hide him no longer, she's going to do something. She's going to faith. Biblical faith is a verb. For the Greeks, faith is what you believe. For the Jews in the world of the Bible, faith is what you do. We're an embodied faith people. It's going to say she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Now, if you're still with me, say, okay. The question becomes historically and culturally in her world and in her moment, what is she doing here? When she can hide him no longer, she's going to faith. What is that act of faith? She's going to build a basket. She's going to cover it with tar and pitch. Well, again, the Hebrew language, and this is where it starts to get gospel gorgeous. Just look to your neighbor and say, dial in. Dial in. This word basket, it's the Hebrew word tiva. Everybody say that with me. Tiva, which is the same Hebrew word for ark. It's the same exact word used in Genesis 6. And Noah built an ark. And Noah built a tiva. 
Yaakovid builds an ark for Moshe. She is defying the king's edict. She is trying to save his life. We already have a massive salvation through water story with Noah and the ark, and here comes another one. Moshe is going to be saved through an ark in the Nile, and we're getting ready to see it. It's that idea of faith that I think we often don't think about, but we're heading there. The story continues, then she placed the child in it, in the ark, and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Stop and pause. Where are the Hebrew boys being drowned? In the Nile. Where does she put him? In the Nile. Raise your hand if you would have done this differently. I would have been putting Moses in my car and driving inland, getting away from the water. What is Yaakov doing here? She builds this ark. She puts him in the Nile. And then it says his sister, being Miriam, stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Y'all, this is part of why the Bible just absolutely excites me, provokes me, convicts me, encourages me. We know these stories. We know how this story ends. But when Yaakov is living this, she has no idea what's going to happen. She has no idea how her own story is going to play out until she lives it. So we have Miriam looking at a distance. Now, I want to stop and pause, and I want us to go back to Hebrews quickly. Hebrews 10.39 says this, and we're getting ready to hone in on what we can learn about, from Yaakov here about faith. Hebrews 10.39, we've already read it this morning. It says this, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. That's the verse right before Hebrews 11. Right before this great hall of faith, there is something about us as the people of God, oriented in kingdom and not empire. We want to be like Jesus, not like the Pharaoh or the Caesar. And there's something about us. We are a people who do not shrink back. And so what is Yaakov showing us here about this faith that doesn't shrink back? And here's where we start to drop down in it. Sometimes the act of faith that is going to come upon you and me is to actually let something go. It's to lay it down. It's to give something up, but not in apathy, in hope. How many of you have lived life long enough to know that hope hurts? To live with active longing and hopefulness for what we necessarily is not embodied yet in this world. Hope has a pain all its own, and we don't talk about it. You notice Yaakov did not build a coffin for Moses. She built an ark for him. She is looking for his salvation. She is trusting the living God. She puts him in the Nile where the Hebrew boys are being drowned. She's done all she can do. The text said when she could hide him no longer. Yaakov is showing us that faith isn't always charging a mountain or starting a new adventure or embracing something we've never done. No, sometimes the act of faith that's upon us is we need to actually relinquish something but not in apathy and hopeful expectation of what the living God can do when we lay it down, when we give it up, when we send it down the Nile. Have you ever been in a relational rhythm or in a job or in some season of life and it just wasn't working and you knew it, but you didn't know what to do next? Raise your hand. This is part of the human condition. It's part of what we're seeing in Yaakov right now. She can't hide him any longer. She has to do something. What's it going to be? And I want to just talk about this this morning because y'all are my cousins. We do share a city is sometimes you have to go down before you can go up. And as a human race, we don't like to go down. 
we don't like to give up. We don't like to feel like we are losing ground. We don't like to feel like we are moving backwards. How many of you wake up and say, I just hope next year is not as good as this one? We don't do that. It's not the way in our primal sense of being part of the human race. But y'all, sometimes the act of faith that's going to come upon you, it is going to require that you lay something down. It's going to require that you stop white-knuckling, just continuing to do a thing in the way that you've always done it because you're not exactly sure what's going to come next. And this is a moment of dissonance for us when we're in that in-between place. You know, part of why I'm teaching this today, Pastor Susie knows this about me, I am a calendar girl. I feel the calendar in my body. And today's the last day of July, July 31st. But the last day last month was June 30th, and that has become a memorial marker day in my life because it's the date six years ago that I went down. I want to show you a picture of my memorial marker. I have this in my house. If you come in my front door, it's the first thing you will see. I see it. It's the last thing I see going out of the door of my house. It's the first thing I see coming in. Zakar is the Hebrew word for to remember. And you can see the date right there, June 30th, 2016. And six years ago, on June 30th, I had to go down. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. I had served on staff at a church for 17 years. It wasn't working anymore. I am single living in Franklin, Tennessee. Has anybody else here noticed how expensive Franklin, Tennessee is? Right? So I'm afraid, for those of you that do Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram 6, so I'm given to safety. I am Captain Safety, in fact. I am just here to keep you all safe. I'm noticing the exit doors. I've already thought it all through. So the idea of me taking a risk, the idea of me as a single person, like leaving a job without having a job with no sense of what was coming, it was a terror to me. And June 30th, 2016, it was my last day at that church, and I stepped into the nothingness, and I went down. For the first time in my life, I started having panic attacks. I couldn't sleep at night. I am a morning person, y'all. Raise your hand if you're a morning person. Y'all are here at the early service. Where are my night owls? Your day starts at like, I have no idea what you are. We'll never hang out, but I'm sure you're a great human being. I'm a morning person, and y'all, do you know what it's like to wake up at 4.45 in the morning with absolutely nothing to do but freak out at what you've done? Moving into this place where I had just nothing to fill up my days, writhing, did I do the right thing? The next things weren't immediately coming. Y'all, I went down. I'm just going to tell you the truth. I drank one too many margaritas a few times. Just keeping it real. And I did not know what. Y'all, there were times in that season I could not tell if the living God was trying to kill me or heal me. It felt the same. I didn't know up, down, what's next. My community is catching me. They're encouraging me. They're praying for me. But I had to go down because there were some things that the living God was getting ready to do in my life that he couldn't do until I laid it down, let it go, gave it up. Some of you sitting here this morning may be in a season like this, and y'all are. I'm your cousin. And I'm your sister in the faith, and I am so sorry, but I'm about to tell you something that is just true in the world. If you're ready, say okay. Sometimes you have to hurt your heart to help your soul. Sometimes you're going to have to do that thing that feels like it is killing you. Because here's the thing. Sometimes the next things will not open up for you until you let it go, until you lay it down. One of my favorite Old Testament prophets, his name was Isaiah. In Isaiah 45, verse 3, the living God is talking. Hear the word of the Lord. The living God says this. And 
I will give you treasures in the darkness, riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord your God. There are some treasures in the darkness that you and I will never know as long as we're white knuckling, hanging on, not relinquishing, not laying down, not laying go. Maybe you're in a place like this this morning. I want to come back to the Exodus story because I do want us to finish this out because I want it to give some hope to anyone here this morning, and this is the act of faith that's upon you. God's not asking you to charge a mountain right now. He's not asking you to go do some big thing. He's not asking you to advance the thought or move the ball down the field. No, he's asking you to let something go. And if that's you this morning, you know exactly what it is right now because it's that thing that keeps coming up in you that the Spirit of God is bringing to your attention. You know it. There may not be another person in the room that knows it, but if that's you this morning, you know that thing that the living God is inviting you to lay down, to go down, so that he can bring you back up with some treasures you got in the darkness because you faithed. I want us to go back to our story in Exodus 2, and I want to just wash you journey with the word of God and the rest of the story. It says, then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the ark among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she replied. Then his sister, being Miriam, asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? How many of you want to take a wild guess what Hebrew woman she goes to get? Right? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. Did everybody just see that? <laughs> when I see Yaakovet in heaven, hands down, first question is, How much money did the Pharaonic princess pay you to breastfeed your own baby under this imperial edict where Hebrew boys are being drowned in the Nile? The story couldn't even take place till she let him go. There may be some treasures in the darkness for you. Maybe the next place you're going to feel the profound presence of the living God is down there. What is it that you may need to let go of? It continues, Exodus 2, so the woman took the baby and nursed him. Oh, I love that. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. You know, I told you at the beginning of this morning that Moses is often referred to as the deliverer. And I love this line that it was Yaakov's faith that delivered the deliverer. All that Moses would ever do, it started with his mother letting him go. Who knows what the living God may has in store for you, but you won't know it till you go down so that he can bring you back up. Sometimes you're just going to have to hurt your heart to help your soul. What is that for you in your life right now? You know, as we get ready to transition to the communion table, I want to fast forward to the New Testament. And we have this amazing one time from all we know in the text of the New Testament that happens to Jesus. The story is called the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is going to take three of his disciples up on a mountain, and he's going to become physically glorified in their presence. How many of you want to know what that looked like? 
just glowing like a light bulb, maybe levitating off the ground. But what's interesting is there are two Old Testament figures that show up, Elijah and Moses. Moses is present at the Mount of Transfiguration. All he would ever do started with the faith of his mother to lay him down, to build an ark, not a coffin, to let him go in hopeful expectation, not apathy. We are not a people who shrink back from hard things. The Spirit of God, the Word of God is teaching us how to do hard things. I want to put some questions up as we end our time together this morning, and I see Susie with the mic. So I'm going to ask these questions, and then Susie's going to, is that okay? Am I doing all right? Okay. Are we doing okay? Everybody okay? The questions are obvious, but is your sister in Christ, is your cousin in the city? I'm going to put them in front of you right now. Number one, by faith, what is it that you need to let go of? Number two, by faith, what is it that you need to lay down? And by faith, what is it that you need to give up? What's coming up for you right now? What is the Spirit of God saying to your inner man or your inner woman right now? Susie, you have some questions? Yeah, there's one question. Can there's you... just one question? There's just one question? Right, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Let's make can, it count. Can you, say, can you say more about giving things up with hope, not apathy? What mm. do you think that looks like? Oh, man. Okay. I think that part of spiritual formation in our lives, we talk about disciplines often. Wait, Susie, let me ask one question. What, how long can I talk? I want to be respectful of. Um. I, you got seven more minutes, and then we also have another question here. So don't take the whole seven minutes okay. on this okay. one question. Okay, so I'm just, I'm just trying to <laughs> obey the rules here. I'm working for Pastor Susie today. So oftentimes when we talk about spiritual formations, we talk about the disciplines, Bible study, praying, giving, serving, and all of that's good. So we're going to hold every bit of that. But a much more Jewish, Hebraic world of Jesus understanding is that faith is an invitation into mystery, not certainty. The Jews talk constantly about learning to be a people who can eat the mystery. When the Israelites were in the desert, there was something on the ground every day that God provided. They ate it. It was called what? Manna. In Hebrew, ma na, it's very similar. It's actually a question in Hebrew. It's what is it? Ma na in Hebrew means what is it? So did the Israelites get up every morning, walk out and look down and say, oh, there's manna. I'm from rural Mississippi. So that's a manna on the ground. Or did they wake up, walk outside and look down and say, ma na, what is that? But they ate it because they knew it came from the right hand of God. Part of us cultivating faithfulness and hope, not apathy is there is a difference in laying something down in apathy. That is the way of the world. Learning to lay something down in hopeful expectation is the worshipful acknowledgement that the living God is present, that he sees it, and that he's going to do something. Now, I also need to be absolutely clear because Jacobed got her baby back for a time and got paid by the Pharaonic princess, but we know the rest of the story. We read it later in time. She gave him back again for him to be raised in the Pharaonic household, which would prepare him to be the deliverer. So I think it's not just can we lay something down, but it's literally can we lay it down in a posture of eating the mystery rather than certainty. We think mystery is going to mess us up. Certainty messes us up because it moves everything into a finite box. And all that I know of the living God is back to the Chronicles of Narnia. He's no tame lion. We often don't know how he's going to work or move. So, 
Hi, Christy. I'm good Bo. morning. Good morning. Um, I, my question is, what treasures did God have for you in the darkness of June yeah, 2016? That's a great question. Um, man, I'm going to try not to cry. It was a rough time. Um, I learned that at my worst, he loved me still. Um, when I was faithless, he was faithful. I inherited saints around this city like Pastor Susie. I don't know that we would have ever met. Um, I'd never met her before that season. Um, there's a whole host of people that would fall in that. Um, I felt whittled down in some ways and, and remade. I'm an only child. I think I said six on the Enneagram. I'm a go-getter. I was raised to just go out, kill it, drag it home, and eat it. And sorry, I'm from rural Mississippi. It's that <laughs> all my analogies are like violent and have to do with bears and things. But, um, definitely raised in a family of high performance and achievement. So you're loved as long as you're getting it right. You're loved as long as you're getting the straight A's, you're the good athlete, the, the performance. And, man, I was just a mess. That first six months, July to December 2016, I was a mess. I cried my face off, hurt. My body physically hurt. Panic attacks, couldn't sleep the whole nine. And I've emerged from that because Pastor Susie kind of mentioned it, you know, my life you know, now, um, who it looks a lot different in a lot of ways, but, you know, sometimes people look at my life like maybe a greater presence or teaching around the nation more or internationally, and, and what they see is this sense of increase. But what I actually feel is that I'm actually giving the world a truer me. I have more of me to give the world a more authentic version of me. And I may not make straight A's for you, and I may not win the game for you, but I will actually bring my whole person. I will sit with you, and I will listen to your story, and I will honor it, and I will seek to be a good sister in Christ to you, and I'm learning that that's enough. And that was a huge treasure that came in the darkness, but it hurt. Um, it hurt hard um, to get here. So that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Are I we going to move it. to the table now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to invite the band to come up. I love that you all share in communion each and every week here at Journey Church. There are four tables that are set for you. I love how Pastor Susie calls it an open table. I love that. Jesus was known as a man who ate with tax collectors and sinners. So the nourishment in communion, the nourishment in remembering the body and the blood of Jesus given for you and for me. So the band, I think, is going to play. But as we share in communion this morning, I'll lend on this. If there's something upon you, and it's going to hurt you greatly to lay it down or to give it up, the only thing I've ever found that makes that worth it is Jesus himself. So as we remember him, as we physically get up and move to these open tables to share in communion, you can write a prayer down, roll it up, and, and put it in the little holes in the wall. But I want you to just be open to ask the living God, is there something I need to lay down? Is there something I need to give up? And to ask the living Christ to be worth it for you, to let the answer to that be yes that he'll give you the grace to do that today. So the tables are open for you, church. Let's all go share in communion together. Thank you all. It's been so good just to be with you all this morning. Thank you.